Hello and welcome to News Central Now. I am Adebola Adeba. The top stories at this hour. Death toll rises to 153 in Jigawa tanker explosion. Nigerian senators pass a vote of confidence on Senate President Godswilla Fabio. Kenya's Mbatsu Deputy President Gachagwao falls ill minutes before testimony. In details. News Central now, where this hour begins with updates on the fuel tanker tragedy in Chigawa State, where we understand that a death toll from the explosion in Majia has risen to 153, with 100 people hospitalized. Police spokesperson BSP Lawan Shisu confirmed the updated figures. Victims have been buried in mass grave, while the injured are receiving treatment at various hospitals, including Aminu Kano and Gomel. Governor Omar Namadi expressed deep sorrow over the tragedy, visiting the site and attending the mass burial. He assured the public that the state will cover medical expenses for the injured and provide support to affected families. Namadi urged the public to prioritize safety and avoid accident sites during emergencies to prevent further casualties. Earlier, survivors recount their experience. Na <laughs> Nino <laughs> Oil, thinking that it's an oof. They didn't know, little did they know that uh, it is a cause of death. Uh, so some of them that engaged in patching this uh, fuel were caught up with the fire. In the process of taking, there is a flash of light and the place caught, caught fire. Let's now tell you that the federal government has issued a warning to Nigerians living near the river Benue to move to safer areas as water levels rise due to heavy rainfall. The Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency, NIHSA, raised the alarm saying the flood risk is high. NIHSA Director General Omar Mohammed also advised those along River Niger to relocate as dam managers at Kanji and Jeba work to control water flow. He urged Nigerians to cooperate with emergency agencies to minimize flood damage. This follows a release of water from Lagdo Dam in Cameroon, which has caused widespread flooding in recent years, including deadly incidents in 2023 and 2024. We we'll now switch gears to politics where there are indications that the crisis rocking the Labour Party has taken a new dimension with the alleged resignation of members from the party. Candidates who emerged to fly the flag of the Labour Party for the local government election as councillors and chairmen are said to have been directed to resign the membership of the party and register with the Zenith Labour Party. Our correspondent Chiwe Ugele throws more light. The recent judgment by a federal high court in Abuja recognizing Julius Aburi as the authentic chairman of Labour Party in Nigeria obviously dealt a blow on the new structure of the party. Apparently, in order to avoid suffering possible invalidation of their election due to nomination of candidates who emerged from the Kartika Committee's faction, they have duly resigned their membership of Labour Party and pitched tents with the Zenith Labour Party. We have only one Labour Party in the country, in Nigeria, and that is the one led by Abure. So there is no other. The chairman of the Zenith Labour Party in Abu State, Prince Onukwe, in an interview with journalists, confirms the registration of new members in his party. Uh, we prepare for the election. 
even before the labor people come and join us. And we determine to win. And the politics is a game of number. And that is why when they came to join us, we are happy so that we, will, we add with the additional number we have. Although he will not give details of the new entrants, News Central TV has it on good authority that those who recently joined the ZLP are the candidates who emerged from the parallel faction of the Labour Party. I'm not a card carrier of Labour Party. I cannot verify that this man has bought, bought from, this man has bought from, but I can't verify. What I will verify is from my own party. However, the National Vice Chairman of the Labour Party under the Julius Abure's faction, C.K. Igara, says the Labour Party's candidates are still intact. We have found the list of our candidates and that is the much I know. We have filed the list of our candidates. If they are entering into Zenith level, I am not aware. Onukwe is excited that he is receiving people into his party despite what circumstances necessitated it and appreciates the governor for his directives. I observe that Governor Les Oti tell them to join us because he doesn't want any people to be distracting him from the good job he's doing for Madras. So, if you people observe what is going on now, you know that in the Labour Party, there is a big, they have problem within themselves. The local government election in Abia State is only two weeks away, yet some political parties are still confused about steps to be taken. In Omaha for News Central, Chiwe Ugele. Nigerian senators have unanimously passed a vote of confidence in the leadership of Senate President Godswell Fabio in a show of solidarity. This comes in response to social media reports on Wednesday suggesting that some northern senators were plotting to impeach the Senate president. During Thursday plenary, former Senate leader Yahya Abdullahi raised a point of order addressing the allegations and expressing his concerns about the publication that claimed northern senators were behind the impeachment move. Abdullahi, who represents Kebi North, described the accusation as a violation of his constitutional right and a citizen and lawmaker. In response, Senate President Akpabi expressed his gratitude for the unwavering support from his colleagues and reassured them of his commitment to providing strong and effective leadership. And I can assure you that there has been no attempt, no attempt that I know of by any caucus or any group among labor senators to bring this code or make any attempt to challenge the legitimacy of your election or to undermine the work the good work that we have been doing in this Senate. I think it is important for some of us that are probably being seen as the frontliners to say, without consulting my friends, my colleagues from the North, that I move that will enforce a vote of confidence in both you, the Senate President, and the Deputy Senate President and the entire leadership of the National Assembly in this regard. Senator Ningi has moved a motion that a vote of confidence should be passed on the leadership of the Senate and seconded by the Senior Senator Abbas. This is further amended by the Minority Leader of the Senate that it should be the entirety of the Senate and not just Northern Senators. And this has also been further seconded by the Senior Senator uh, Sani Musa, um, in a very humble way, I feel humbled, but I'm obligated to put the question. Those who support that this vote of confidence on the Senate leadership be carried, say aye. Those again, say nay. They are not here. The eyes have it. Let's take a short break. Now, when we return, but our new government receives free menstrual hygiene kits for schoolgirls. We have details shortly. Thank you for staying tuned. 
Some school girls in the Federal Capital Territory have expressed their determination to break in barriers limiting their potentials to achieving their dream careers. And this is as non-governmental organizations beyond the classroom marked its 2024 International Day of a Girl Child with a mentoring session meant to empower the girls to envision and shape the world they want to live in. Our correspondent, Imano Bogudu, throws more lights. A show of power, zeal, and determination to break the barriers limiting the girls from achieving their potentials erected by society. This includes barriers erected by religion and tradition, where the girl child is not really given her place and voice in the society, but made to be seen as a lesser being in the scheme of things. The Beyond the Classroom Foundation is inculcating in these girls life skills, including the principles of self-reliance, self-confidence, and self-motivation. Girls want to be teachers, girls want to be medical doctors, girls want to be nurses, and all that, which shows that our girls are actually bold, smart, and very intelligent, looking forward to the future. So what we're trying to do at Beyond the Classroom is not just to bring out women who are very far off on TV, women who they can't reach, we try to ensure that we bring mentors who they can reach, people who have gone beyond their odds, people who they can see face to face and say, oh, hey, this person achieved this. If the person can do that, I can do that also. It's great that we have the likes of Okonje Wela on TV that they can see and emulate, but we, we realize that for most of them, they want mentors that they can feel and see face to face and talk to and be inspired by them. I think that the face to face contact helps better than to have role models that you don't have any um, reach to. So, for us, it's more of a mentor-mentee relationship to build girls than a role-modeling one. My name is Abdudimka Aisha. Aisha Dimka, one of the girls, ruled out her dream of breaking into the male-dominated engineering field. I want to be a mechanical engineer in future because I have always have had a love of cars since I was five. And I want to be the first person because fuel nowadays is in Nigeria is very, very expensive. So I want to be that kind of build that kind of car that when you have a car, you don't have to, you know, have that fear of going to buy fuel or do all those kind of things. You just powered by water and it's water is like everywhere. It's like 70% of our nation because since I was small, I've always heard that girls are the ones that are supposed to cook, the ones that are supposed to do all those um, house chores for the men. But I want, to, I want to say that the first, the president in England, she was a woman. She was a girl before she became a woman. And she was the one that made England like the best country it was today. If people can continue to do more programs like this to help the world to become a better place for women. For the men should also support the girls. The men, that's why I'm saying that this, what we're doing here today is an awareness campaign, an enlightenment campaign to help men know that they need the women to also do well. The women need to contribute their own quota to the society. The event is organized in commemoration of the 2024 International Day of the Girl Child. With a theme, girls, vision for the future. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. As part of efforts to hasten the education recovery process in the aftermath of the devastating floods in Nigeria's brand new state, the zenith of the Girl Child Initiative support has extended a donation of 1,000 hygiene kits to encourage attention of girls in the school. And this is according to the state government, will help go a long way towards improving menstrual health across schools. Our correspondent, Umaru Kirawa, has details. The recent flooding in Borno State has had devastating effects on communities, particularly in terms of educational disruption. Schools have been damaged, resources depleted, and many families displaced. This crisis has put immense pressure on the education system with girls being disproportionately affected. With the effects of flood, all our schools have been operating for two weeks, but our attendance is still about 40% within Medjugorje Township because parents and students alike have lost virtually everything. Uniform, books, food, everything. The State Ministry of Education, Science and Technology is getting 1,000 free menstrual kits for students in school. This kit, which contains sanitary pads, soap, pants, toothpaste, toothbrush, pomades, and bags, 
aim to support this specific need of girls and ensure their retention in school across Borno states. As an organization, it is part of our mandate to advocate for a comprehensive solution that addresses both the immediate needs and the long-term challenges faced by girls in our communities. The 1,000 is a very good effort because you put smiles in the faces of 1,000 school ch girls children, which is very good. And I commend you and I thank you. And I want you to further advocate. Aimed at encouraging the retention of female students in schools, this initiative comes at a time when communities continue to recover from the impact of the flood disaster. We intend to go and reopen two schools in very serious IDP communities behind the Mandara Mountains, communities of Ngoshe and Kirawa in Boza. So I'm going to take some of these two girls in Kirawa, in Ngoshe, in Pulka, and in Bama. By distributing this kit, particularly to the rural communities, the government also targets a reduction in absenteeism and promote a healthier school environment. In Maiduguri for New Central, Omar Kirawa. Senator Oluremi Tinobo, the wife of Nigeria's president, visited Maiduguri, the Brano state capital, to provide essential support to vulnerable populations affected by recent flooding. The wife of the president was impressed with the response of the Brano state government and other stakeholders to manage the flood challenges. Our correspondent, Umaru Kirawa, has details. The struggle for post-flood recovery continues in Nigeria's state of Borno. The experience is one of the darkest in the history of the state. Wife of Nigeria's president, Senator Oluremi Tinibu, and other members of our team of the Renewed Hope Initiative are here to provide support to the victims of the flood. We decided, we've done the petty traders before, that we are going to do another 250 million to cover about 5,000 women petty traders, or 50,000 each. So we'll be doing that immediately we get back to Abuja. I want to uh, say that this will be the last time we will experience this type of disaster in this state and even across in Nigeria. We pray that God will bless this land. It's a very, very special land. The benefiting persons smiled as they received relief items and business grants to pick up the pieces of their lives. <laughs> The Borno State Governor emphasized the government's commitment to alleviating the suffering of flood victims and urged communities to come together in support of one another. We received 500 million naira from Her Excellency under the platform of her Youth Hope Initiative. And we received tremendous support from the federal government. And therefore, on behalf of the government and people of Borno said, I want to convey my deepest appreciation. Nigeria's Minister of Health facilitated the provision of drugs worth millions of naira to support the well-being of the flood victims. The Federation of Nigerian Pharmaceutical Industry Association, the local manufacturers of pharmaceutical products in Nigeria, they pull together pharmaceutical products antibiotics, antimalarials, all necessary life-saving products. Residents were encouraged to participate actively in rebuilding their lives and community support. In Maiduguri for New Central, Umuru Kirawa. The International Day for Eradication of Poverty, observed on October 17th every year, provides opportunity to reflect on the plights of the poor marginalized and vulnerable populations around the world. In 2024, this day holds a special significance for Nigeria as a country faces severe economic challenges, including skyrocketing, skyrocketing inflation, widespread unemployment, and worsening insecurity under President Bola Tinubu's administration. 
Nigeria is home to one of the world's largest populations of people living in extreme poverty. As of 2024, over 40% of the population lives on less than $1.90 a day, according to the World Bank estimates. Earlier, UNICEF Deputy Executive Director Partners Kitty Van shared her thoughts on this. is really to make sure that children from conception to the end of adolescence have every right to survive, to thrive and to be equipped for a future that looks very different than when I left high school. So we're really here from humanitarian crisis to development to skilling of young people for a green economy to make sure that we invest together with the public sector, so the government of Nigeria with the private sector partners to make sure that children actually have every chance in the world to escape what you were just mentioning, deep entrenched poverty and marginalization. First of all, we need to do what the president has said at the budget speech in 2023. He literally said, children are the foundation of the future. And that is so true. So investing in children is an economically rational decision. It's not a cherry on the cake. It is an essential part of the recipe of economic transformation to make sure that children are healthy, that they're educated, that they are equipped, but also, and this is an important part for the future of Nigeria with a very young population, that they're skilled with the green and digital skills that will actually lend them a job, which is a pathway to a life in dignity and prosperity. So across the entire chain, listening to those words, children are the foundation of the future. Let's invest in them because they're worthy of everyone. A federal high court in Abuja has adjourned two billion naira fundamental rights enforcement suit filed by former caretaker chairman of Saddam Ijo local government by a state in person of Mr. Loki Okode until November 28th. Justice Binta Yako made a decision on Thursday after Okode's counsel. Asmao Yunusa requested more time to respond to a counter affidavit filed by the legal representative for the Chief of Defense Staff, General, General Christopher Mosa. The case, originally filed in May by Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, involves Okode suing both the Chief of Defense Staff, General Musa, and the Chief of Army Staff, General Tariq Lagbaja, over allegations that his photograph was wrongfully published among those wanted in connection with the killing of 17 soldiers in Okwama Delta State. During Thursday's proceedings, Justice Nyako suggested that both parties could resolve the issue amicably rather than prolonging the legal battle and adjourn the case for further mention on November 28th. She also ordered that the second respondent be served with a hearing notice. Beyond the security implications, Africa's oil-dependent economies are bracing for impact as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The crisis has sent oil prices soaring, threatening to derail fragile economic gains and plunge millions into poverty. Our correspondent, Igbalani Yomoni, has details. The geopolitical situation in the Middle East has created significant challenges across multiple dimensions. Supply chain disruptions stemming from OPEC production cuts and sanctions on Iran have been compounded by investor uncertainty and increased exposure for African economies that rely heavily on imported oil. Skyrocketing oil prices now threaten to undermine fragile economic gains and push millions deeper into poverty. So now when I go bust open and say I want to carry a high price, they will just say it's my fault. But the money I will keep one side say this one will you yeah, are using to eat. I think I'll talk before the game. It's a new game now. In Nigeria, Africa's largest oil producer, GDP growth projections have been reduced by 20%, exacerbating existing economic difficulties. Neighboring countries like South Africa have seen few price hikes trigger labor strikes. Meanwhile, Egypt continues navigating austerity measures that include slashing costly fuel subsidies. Higher commodity prices risk stalking inflation across the continent, particularly in nations with depreciating currencies like Ghana. As Africans' main oil importers, these countries find themselves uniquely vulnerable to price volatility outside their control. Between the Middle East and North Africa, there is one major way by which they would export oil, 
whether to Europe or the Far East, and that's through the Mediterranean. So you're passing through the Gulf of Aden, you're passing through the Eastern Mediterranean, you're passing through the Red Sea, and all of these places have two points. I just talked about Iran, how mm. it's going to affect these things. I also talked about the Houthis in Yemen and how they've been disturbing shipping ever since October 7 attacks and so many things. So um, in whichever way you look at it, it doesn't really look good, look good for the continent, the countries in the continent around where this problem is. But Conditions on the ground span from acute fuel shortages to rapidly rising costs that weaken purchasing power. Such developments exacerbate poverty and unemployment placing small businesses and entrepreneurs under considerable financial strain simply to maintain operations. Everything at cost, both food, to get the fuel to build the food is a problem. Faced with these challenges, African leaders have been urged to diversify energy resources and boost energy efficiency. We share a common commitment to collaborate, renew and accelerate the transition towards a sustainable energy future for Africa. It signifies a commitment to work together across borders, sectors, and disciplines to harness the abundant renewable resources that Africa possesses. The current situation serves as an important reminder of the region's dependence on the unstable global energy markets as events unfold. Demonstrating resilience and adaptation will be paramount to sheltering vulnerable populations from the crisis harshest humanitarian consequences. In Lagos for New Central, I am Igbalani Omani. Let's look a short break now when we return. NLC TUC leaders meet federal government for talks. Details shortly. Join us again. Thank you for staying tuned. The federal government held talks with labor representatives to discuss the new petrol price regime and other key issues. The meeting took place at the office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, with discussions focusing on the new minimum wage adjustment and compressed natural gas initiative. Government officials presents, presents included National Security Advisor Nuhu Ribado, Labor Minister in Kiro Kaonye, Georgia, and Finance Minister Wali Edum. Labour leaders, including the NLC President Joe Ojero, voiced concerns over the fuel price hike calling for a re reversal. Minister of Information Mohamed Idris described the talks as a normal engagement to address national issues, stressing that the government prioritizes ongoing dialogue with Labour. And to unpack this, we're joined by a public affairs analyst and that's uh, Francis Chilaka. Good evening. Glad to have you join me on the news. Good evening. I'm good. And you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I believe it's a fine place to kick off by asking what your thoughts are regarding the recurring fuel price, you know, you know, fuel scarcity we're having in Nigeria. I think it's a deliberate act by government, and um, it's not speaking well for this government. Uh, I don't understand why we should be having a scarcity at this point in time considering the fact that the price has gone up severally. So if we're having scarcity when the price has gone up to 900, 1,000, 1,000 plus, then it's a deliberate act by government to be able to justify the fact that they're increasing the price. Hmm. Now, uh, what are your expectations regarding this meeting with uh, labor representatives as well as uh, the government? What are your thoughts? What are you anticipating? I don't expect anything to come out of it because I believe that uh, what is playing out is that the government understands um, the, 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 the rules of the game better than labor. And what they're doing is that they're taking labor for a ride. Um, and then labor keeps falling into the hands of government. I mean, I remember in 2012 when um, the Jonathan government increased um, the price of pump price, but I mean, pump of um, the price of the pump. And as of that time, you know, it, it, we didn't wait for one week or two weeks for labor to hold a meeting with anybody. And everybody came out and said, no, this is outrageous. I mean, even then, I mean, looking back, I, I, I find it very, very painful that as at the time um, the pump price was moved from 180 to 200, Nigerians all came out on the streets. And today, we same Nigerians we are begging for the price to be brought down to 800, 900. It's, it's rather shameful. Mm -hmm. It simply shows the fact that, you know, this government does not have um, the, 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 the people at heart. It's not a people-oriented government at all. Mm. 
So then what should Labour be doing differently to ensure price, the pump price of PMS is you know, re reversed? Well, I think Labour shouldn't uh, come up with this whole idea of um, a review of the national minimum wage. Never, Labour shouldn't be thinking about that. Labour rather should be asking government to cut the cost of governance. You know, that is one thing Labour should do. And also Labour should put government on their toes in terms of security. You know, so these are areas. And then we should know as Nigerians, we have the right to know how much Dan Gote himself is selling this petrol to either an MPCL or the independent marketers. So these are the things Labour should demand for. At the same time, Labour should demand for the, the cut in the, 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 the price of uh, electricity. You know, these are, I want Labour to ask for things that affect every Nigerian, not just a small group of workers, but every Nigerian that is out there. If the price of petrol comes down to 300, 400, every Nigerian will enjoy it. So we should focus on the things that will add value to the lives of every Nigerian and not just the Labour Congress. Well, some will say that Labour already are uh, trying to hold government to account by calling for strike actions, you know, going on strikes. Uh, so how else would you suppose Labour, you know, pressurize government to listen to the yearnings of the people? Well, if, you, if Labour is calling for strike, let them not call for the kind of strike that makes them look uh, stupid at the end of the day. You don't call for one day strike and then without benefiting or without achieving the aims of that strike, you call off the strike because you're going back to negotiations. If negotiations are broken down, then Labour should take the next action, which is to protest and go on strike. And then you, you, you stand by that strike until you get results to what you want. But unfortunately, the, 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 the Labour Congress we have today and the TUC, uh, I don't really understand the kind of uh, people we have as leaders. Mm. Because, because you don't start a strike and in the middle of the strike, you call it off, the government says, oh, come back to the negotiation table, and you know that it's all fun, it's all joke. So I think, for me, I would say, okay, if Labour wants to go on strike, let them know that that strike will be more than all strikes, and nothing will stop until they get results from government. All right, thank you so much for your insight on the news. Francis Chilaka, public affairs analyst. Many thanks indeed. You're welcome. Kenyan Deputy President Regathi Gachagwao has fallen ill just minutes before he was set to take the stand as a key witness, and this is according to his lawyer, Paul Mute. Meanwhile, Senate Speaker Amson Kingi has since suspended the impeachment trial, giving Gachagwao's legal team two hours to locate him. However, Amson Kingi said failure to do that, the hearing will continue without the Deputy President. And to talk about this, uh, we're joined by Tele Nzomo, Program Officer, Siasa Place. Good evening from here. Glad to have you join me on the news. All right, uh, let me proceed by asking you first, uh, what is the state of things right now regarding impeachment proceedings against the Vice President? Yeah, just to pick up from where you left, um, since the um, since this, this, the Senate had been um, since the Senate trial had uh, sorry the Senate trial had been um, stopped by this by the Speaker, um, they came back um, and the lawyers of um, the Deputy President requested that um, the uh, that the Senate trial be postponed until Tuesday next week. But the Speaker ruled that because um, the timelines uh, the constitutional timelines for impeachment are rigid and that the, uh, the, the process has to be completed in 10 days, that the latest they could suspend it was until Saturday. And he let the senators um, vote on the matter, but the senators voted to continue uh, with the impeachment. And as, uh, as we speak, just before I came on, um, the last day I had left, the, this, this Senators were actually now um, deliberating on the, uh, were giving sentiments on the motion, and I expect that a vote will take place maybe in an hour or so, or maybe by 10, 10 p.m. Kenyan time, that is. Mm. Okay, let's talk about health now, interplaying with this case. Uh, do you think the vice president's reported illness, you know, can be used to, so to speak, garner sympathy or rally for support? Um, I don't know whether it will be used to gain sympathy. Um, I do think that it might be used 
by the deputy president um, at a later stage, at a legal stage. I fully expect that after the Senate votes and uh, the way things are going, I fully expect that the Senate will vote to impeach him. Um, the deputy president will head to the to the courts, and I think that um, I, I think that the fact that the, the he was not cross examined um, might be used by his lawyers. Um, I think the fact that. They did not postpone um, the, 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 the Senate trial might be used by the lawyer. So I think this is a ploy maybe to look at it from a legal term. The other side, you can look at it as a way as a way maybe for him to try and, and buy time to, to, to think of something to do. But I think now time time is done. And I fully, as I said, I fully expect that he'll be impeached within an hour or so. All right. Thank you so much for your time on the news. Tell Zomo. Program Officer Siasa Place. Many thanks indeed. Thank you so much. Namibia will go or will go to the polls on 27th day of November to choose their next president and parliamentary representatives. The ruling party SWAPO has been a dominant force in Namibian politics since the country's independence from apartheid South Africa in 1990. Despite its significant electoral successes. 80% of the National Assembly votes in 2013, an uninterrupted rule spanning over three decades, the party faced a pivotal shift in the 2019 elections. However, SWAPU and its female presidential candidate, 71-year-old Natembo Nandi, are expected to win the November 2024 elections. Analysts say the party will likely continue to lose support and potentially fail to secure a majority necessitating coalition talks with opposition parties. And to unpack this, I was joined by Raquel Andres, a political analyst joining us from Windhoek, Namibia. Um, good evening from here. Let me kick off by asking how you would assess uh, the current strength of the Swato party in light of this recent, you know, uh, death of the president, you know, uh, Gengo. Do you think this has impacted the party's influence in upcoming elections? Um, good evening to you. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, what I do want to clarify, I think, is to say that um, before we lost our late president, the Swapo party had already had its Congress. It had already um, selected its um, candidate for this year's election. So his passing does not have a significant impact because the party was already very clear about who, who they would be fielding um, in the election. But then from an intra-politics perspective, um, there were, of course, those that thought they could take advantage of the vulnerabilities that the late president's passing might have posed for the party. And there are there have been some court challenges on the legitimacy of the candidacy of um, um, Netumbo Nandi Deitua um, to that effect. Hmm. Okay, looking at the elections, so let's talk about opposition uh, opposition parties. How strong are they? Uh, do you think they stand a chance in this election? Namibian opposition is grossly fragmented. Um, we have seen how they are at the local and regional level where they were able to put a dent in Swapo's majority foothold and they were struggling to work with one another. Um, at most uh, for the presidential race, um, they quite, um, it looks like they are unlikely to know how to work with one another. Um, and it's that fragmentation that gives a lot of um, opportunity, a lot of ground to Swapo, because the votes that they could have amassed had they organized themselves in um, realistic coalitions could have given them an opportunity against Swapo, but because of the fact that they are so fragmented, um, yeah, they, they don't, they are not a very strong opposition <laughs> collectively. All right, let's talk about Namibians uh, for a moment. What are the pressing issues Namibians are looking forward to seeing resolved as these elections, you know, are, you know, about to happen? Um, we had our latest census um, last year after the last one was only done in 2011. So, uh, so, so what that means basically is that for the first time in a few years, we are able to really have an idea on our exact population size. Of course, compared to Nigeria, it's probably then about uh, equivalent to a, um, a suburb. 
if I can put it like that, we are sitting at a lovely 3.4 million. Um, so with that number now, uh, we're able to gauge uh, based off of the number of registered voters. And at this particular juncture, we're living, uh, we're sitting with 90% registered voters um, that we're anticipating to turn up on the 27th of November. But um, in as much as we're a small population, there's a high, about 40% youth unemployment in this country. Uh, at the same time, in terms of Gini coefficient, there's high income inequality um, in Namibia in as much as we have vast resources. So really the issues that Namibians are concerned about is bread and butter issues. It's issues around employment, it's issues around um, access to good quality health and infrastructure, it's issues around um, sanitation, it's issues around uh, food security. So those are the main issues that Namibians are looking um, at, and these are the main issues that ideally uh, political parties are supposed to convince us that they will address when they to be voted into power. Well, we'll keep it talk with you like they say, may the best man win. Thank you so much for your time on the news. Raquel Andres, political analyst. Many thanks indeed. Thank you. Lagos will host the 10th edition of the Zainab Saleh International Female Karate Open Championship. The tournament will be held in conjunction with the Lagos State Karate Association and will begin in October 19th, 2024 at the Moladi Okoya Thomas Hall of the Teslim Balogun Stadium. The tournament aimed at promoting female karate Karatekas is a ranking event on the Karate Federation of Nigeria's calendar and will follow World Karate Federation rules. Categories at the event include cadet, junior, under 21 with participants from Nigeria, Togo and Benin. Referee exams and training sessions will be held on October 18th with the main belt starting October 19th and finals October 21st. Zainab Saleh, who is the organizer of the event, as well as vice chairman of the Lagos State Karate Association, highlighted the competition as a crucial for fellow karate talent development in West Africa. And that wraps up the news. Uh, but before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Death toll rises to 153 in Jigawa tanker explosion. Nigerian senators pass a vote of confidence on Senate President Gotu Lafabio. Kenya's Mbatu Deputy President Kachagwao falls ill minutes before testimony. You can watch New Central Live on DSTV, Channel 422, Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adebola. <laughs>